This is CBC Here and Now. had a lot of training. I think a lot of us feel actually very prepared. Someone from every walk of life is going to be our customer. Countdown to cannabis. Just hours now from marijuana legalization. Retailers busy with the final preps. We're all here just hope, hoping to get a ticket. Uh, it's a long line, but we'll take our time. We'll get through it. You know, it's a couple hundred people, but it's not 2,000. Hundreds brave the wind and rain for hometown tickets to come from away. But a warning to online shoppers, buyer beware. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. Well, the countdown is on to the legalization of marijuana. Newfoundland is the first place in the country where it will be legal to buy weed. And in just six short hours, some retail locations will be open for business. We start our coverage tonight with Peter Cowan and fears that there might not be enough product to go around. One of the big questions for people has been what sort of products are you going to be able to buy at a store like this come midnight and the shipments have started coming in. For example, here we've got a package of two pre-rolled joints. This will sell for about 13 bucks. If you want to roll your own, you can buy seven grams here. This will be about $80. But this is just some of the product that they're going to have on the shelves. However, it's not going to be as complete a range as they were hoping. For example, at this store, only two of the seven suppliers were actually able to ship them something for opening day. And what they were able to get is less than they were expecting. So they won't be able to sell as much and as quickly, and they're expecting to sell out. But one of the key questions will be, Will people actually ditch their dealer for a legalized store? And the owner here thinks he has a selling proposition. They'll want to try something different. So they'll still come down to the shop and say, oh, well, let me try a gram of this or let me try a gram of that. You know, uh, there's going to be stuff that's available at the shop that people can't get on the black market and they'll know there's no mold or pesticides in the weed. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to turn a lot of black market customers over to this new legal market. This is going to be just one of the stores that opens at midnight tonight. They'll only be able to stay open for two hours, though, because of the regulations, and then reopen again at 9 a.m. Peter Cowan, CBC News, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. In downtown St. John's, several cannabis retailers are also getting in on the midnight rush. Here next, Zach Gowdy. Here now, Zach Gowdy is at one of those shops and joins us live with a preview. Zach, what should people expect? Well, that is the million dollar question right now. I am at the Natural Vibe, which is a natural product store on Water Street. It, uh, unlike the Thomas Clark store that you just saw, the marijuana here is not on display. It is locked in a cabinet behind the counter, but it is here. And you just heard the phone ringing while people are calling, looking for details about tonight. Uh, the Natural Vibe is going to be open for business at midnight, and along with Thomas Clark and the Tweed store just up the road here on Water Street, they will be racing to ring in Canada's first legal marijuana sale. They tell me the phone's been ringing like that for quite a while. Uh, it's going to happen here at midnight, but what happens after that? What will the scene be like? Will there be a long lineup? Who's coming out? Will it be a frenzy or a more of a mellow vibe? Well, we will all be waiting to find out. But after the hype of the first day dies down, the owners of the Natural Vibe are as curious as anyone to see who their cannabis customers will be. I'm not 100% sure. I guess you never really know. I do feel that um, a lot of our current customers uh, may kind of make their way over to the cannabis counter. Uh, also because of our location, we are downtown, um, close to George Street. We will probably have a lot of um, people who may want to enjoy before they go out a night on the town, um, just coming from a restaurant. So I think we're going to see a good variety. Now, one way or another, Canadian history will be made in Newfoundland and Labrador tonight, and CBC is going to bring you the big moment live. Our Countdown to Cannabis special will be streaming on the CBC NL Facebook page. Uh, you can start tuning in at around 11.45 Newfoundland time, but at midnight, the first legal cannabis sales in the country are going to happen here in this province. Debbie, one way or another, it's going to be a very exciting night so much. That's our Zach Gowdy reporting for us live this evening. Well, if you were hoping to score a set of Come From Away tickets for the tour's Newfoundland stop, you may be out of luck. 
Hundreds braved the rain outside Holy Heart Theater in St. John's today to secure tickets, some arriving as early as 5 a.m. But when online tickets became available at 10, the website quickly crashed. By lunchtime, tickets for all eight Newfoundland performances had sold out, which means many who braved the wet and cold walked away empty-handed. Jenton said they're all, almost all sold out. The evening ones are sold out. Okay. It's just yeah. daytime. But people are buying massive amounts of tickets. That's the problem. I got here around 10.30 and uh, I had tried online at uh, you know 10 o'clock when it opened and the system had crashed. And what we're hearing is uh, somebody went into the box office and apparently there's nothing left now but singles for weeknights. So you know we're all here just hope, hoping to get a ticket. I'm here in the rain and the wind today. And in good spirits. And it's going to take about an hour or so, but you know, I'll dry out. We keep asking as people come out. I think the evening shows are sold out, but the afternoon shows have some tickets left. So we're going to wait it out and see. And good. Hope. Yep. <laughs> And buyer beware, Opera on the Avalon, which helped bring the Broadway show home, is warning that most tickets for sale online are fakes. Websites like Kijiji, Craigslist, and NL Classifieds have listings for fraudulent come-from-away tickets selling for more than $200 each. <laughs> So I didn't go out in the rain, but I was on my mobile device and my computer trying to get tickets today and uh, did not work out for me. Well, I was maybe, unsuccessful. Maybe it was good that you weren't online. Well, at the Bonafide uh, Theater office online, yes, but not on the other ones, I gather. Hmm. Yes, yeah. No, so it's too bad. I know a lot of people wanted to see it and, uh, well, a lot of people probably will, just not me. <laughs> <laughs> or me. I didn't get tickets either. So, um, Ashley, what you predicted came to be. It, my goodness, it rained. My first storm today. Uh, I went out at lunchtime, almost got blown away. <laughs> so welcome to real St. John's weather now. Yeah, yesterday. welcome, welcome yeah. to Newfoundland. Um, yeah, today, you know, we saw all that wind and rain this afternoon. It's been snowy for parts of Labrador. We'll take a look at uh, some of the weather on the way over the next uh, 24 hours. Again, we're going to see more snow tonight for Labrador. We're looking at another five, maybe 10 centimeters in some cases. Uh, it was the windiest day for one town across the island today in 19 years. I'll have those details coming up in a little bit. And then uh, it does look like the first snowfall possible uh, Thursday night into Friday for some parts of the island. We could see accumulations, a couple centimeters, maybe even more. The models are a little bit up in the air at this point, but we will take a look at that. And then uh, when these winds are going to die down across the province coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. The National Inquiry in Inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women continued in St. John's today with a first-hand account of what life is like for those in the sex trade. An Inuk woman told her story about how she ended up on the streets of Ottawa when she was just a teenager. Now the CBC's Bailey White has been covering the inquiry. Bailey, what did you learn about this woman's story? Well, Mialia Shudiapuk explained that she actually had a pretty normal life until she was 11 or 12 years old. That's when she witnessed a murder. She was traumatized and she didn't know how to cope. So by the time she was 15, she had moved to Ottawa with a 29-year-old boyfriend who soon started abusing her. Thinking about my grandma and my siblings, leaving them behind, I end up using more hard drugs. And that also escalated me to go on the street and try and get more money to get high. Shudiapak said she felt like sex work was the only way she could make money to support her addictions. She would try to get other jobs, but then she'd get fired for using drugs. And she talked about trying to find help. There were programs available for Inuit women, but they were not easy to access. Now, eventually she did get clean and find a job with a church, but she says there are still many Indigenous women working in the sex trade because they feel like they have no other choice. So I tried helping some girls before too. Because <laughs> I know how it is. It was scary. But when you're high on drugs, you have no fear. One of the big themes today was how hard it is for people from small, isolated communities to adjust to life in big cities like Ottawa or even St. John's. Elizabeth Zarpa is an Inuk from Labrador. Especially in St. John's, there could be more programming around Inuit uh, for educational purposes, transportation, cultural support, language. 
And Zarpa says just having a place where Inuit could get together, maybe throat sing, have traditional meals, would help newcomers feel supported and hopefully ease the transition into city life. The inquiry continues tomorrow. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Bailey White for Here and Now. It's a horrific case with horrific allegations of physical and sexual abuse. A former foster child says the government repeated, repeatedly placed her in dangerous houses despite her complaints. But the lawsuit is being hampered by document delays, and the woman's lawyer has had enough. Here now is Ryan Cook reports. Jane Doe says she was forced to do things to the other children in her foster home and forced to watch as the mother battered them physically and sexually. When she reported it, she was placed in a different home where she says she was abused again and then moved back to the original home. I'm representing a woman whose life was very, very tragically impacted by abuse. Uh, really, it's a tale of, of horror what happened to her as a child in not one but several foster homes uh, where she was abused. The case is now before the courts, but it's already facing delays. Lynn Moore hasn't been able to get her hands on her client's personal files, like a list of homes she stayed in or any incident reports that may have been made. And that creates problems for the court's timelines. When a person files a lawsuit, the other side has a certain amount of time to file its statement of defense. They then have to send all of their documents back over within 10 days. But it takes an average of 502 days for former foster children to obtain their private records from the government. That's 50 times longer than court rules. They have to file an access to information request, and typically these things must be returned within 30 days of filing. But child welfare issues actually fall outside of the regulations, meaning there is no deadline. The question is, are these people less valuable? than people who are accessing their information under AGIP? Well, no, of course they're not. So why do they have to wait for this long period of time? It is ridiculous in this day and age. Moore wants the judge to demand the government turn the records over by the end of October. But a lawyer for the Justice Department says it'll be more like the end of November. From our perspective, that isn't unreasonable, uh, given the file, given particularly we we'll want to make sure it's not rushed. Moore says if you don't want to be rushed, then hire more people to dig for the documents and prioritize the Jane Doe's of this province. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. There's word tonight that a tax increase coming to St. John's residents next year will likely be lower than expected. The city is planning to increase property taxes to help ease its projected $12 million deficit. However, it turns out there is a $3 million surplus from the 2017 budget. That amount, along with other money available from a reserve fund, will be put towards the city's pension debt. Council says that will allow the city to reduce spending. The projected deficit is now expected to be approximately $10.4 million. The environmental costs and benefits of the hydroelectric project were discussed at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry today. It was one of the issues former NALCOR board members addressed when they took the stand for a second day. Mark Quinn reports. One of the justifications for Muskrat Falls is that it's a green project that will help the province decommission the dirty oil-burning Holyrood facility. Speaking at the inquiry today, lawyer Jeff Budden asked if the idea that the project is clean influenced the Nalcor board's vote to approve it. No, our, our decision making came down to a strictly financial business case and the, and the environmental issues and concerns were noted. Protesters in Labrador fear methyl mercury produced by the project will harm the environment and taint country food downstream. But at least one Nalcor board member said that's not expected to be a big problem. It, it was not expected to be a, a massive increase in methylmercury. It was a very small reservoir attached to the Muskrat Falls project, nothing like the reservoir that Churchill Falls has. Of course. And the methylmercury from Churchill Falls was minuscule. We expected a, a, some, but a low level of methylmercury downstream of Muskrat Falls. Board members believe the project will have environmental benefits for the province by ridding the island of the Holyrood facility. But they said that's just icing on the cake, not the principal financial reason for doing it. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. An Inuit man living in St. John's is teaching Canadians across the country about his culture. 
Angus Anderson offers one-on-one -on -one classes for Inutut, the Labrador dialect of Inututuk, and he's hosting all of his sessions online using Facebook and Twitter. My name is Angus Anderson from Nain, Labrador, Nunatiavut, and I'm planning, or I will be teaching kin uh, students from kindergarten to grade eight across Canada, British Columbia to Newfoundland, about the uh, language, the culture, the history of Labrador. Something like this needs to be done more often, more frequent, to reach out to children in the South that I have, well, never, probably never experienced going to Northern Labrador, Nunavut, Inuvial, to the Arctic regions and meet, actually meet and go to Inuit communities. So this would be my way of re helping to reach out to them to learn about Inuit. Uh, I do Inuit classes online using Facebook one-on-one -on -one using the uh, webcam and this is a little different because this is going to mass nearly 200 classrooms all at once but when I teaching it's one-on-one -on -one using Facebook when the students are available to take the classes okay it, here is uh, it's raining very heavy today here in St. John Manda St. John is overwhelming because it seems there's all of a sudden seem to be a desire and need people want to learn more not just about the culture but also the language maybe we can have a spin-off from this because apparently there are other groups are interested in this similar teaching format so maybe like from this uh, a kids guide to canada will be spin-offs of more teaching of Labrador Inuit or in like maybe other Inuit from different parts of Canada will see this and they can do this also. Having the right to civil marriage, that is a very, very important right and that is an evolution. MHA Jerry Byrne facing pushback after taking part in Corner Brook Pride activities. All because of his stance more than a decade ago.
Martin O'Hara traveled the world, but he didn't find home until he found Burgio. The Burgio come from away, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. So that was the beautiful beach in Burgio. Oh, gorgeous. If, you, if you haven't been, you gotta go. It's pretty amazing. I have not. Yeah. <laughs> now, while it was rainy here today, it was almost beach-like weather. Would you say it was pretty mild? It pretty was warm. mild. I, yeah. I would say that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it felt quite warm, even with those winds and that rain. Uh, if we take a look at some of those temperatures that we reached this afternoon across the island, 15 degrees here in St. John's. Uh, Badger, same thing. And then towards Corner Brook, sitting at uh, about 14 degrees this afternoon. Uh, uh, the temperature quite significantly cooler as we head into Labrador, though. Happy Valley Goose Bay, two degrees. Labrador City at zero this afternoon. Those temperatures uh, still hovering within a couple of degrees in Labrador, but down through the southern uh, half of the province on the island, uh, those temperatures have dropped, and that's because we've shifted from that southerly flow to more of an easterly flow. Uh, Corner Brook down to six degrees, St. Lawrence nine, and then same temperature in um, St. John's right now. So the story today was those winds. Here's some of the numbers uh, for the top wind gusts so far. 107 in the Rec House area. St. Lawrence, 109 kilometers per hour earlier today. St. John's topped out at 100. And then uh, Gander saw a gust of 102 kilometers per hour today. And that was the windiest October day in 19 years uh, for there. Otherwise, we're seeing those other um, areas with uh, wind gusts somewhere between 60 and 80 kilometers per hour. And those winds will continue as we head through the night tonight. Uh, slowly easing, though, we still have those wind warnings in place. Snowfall warning for Norman Bay looking at another 10 centimeters tonight and then Eagle uh, River another 5 to 10 centimeters otherwise we have that special weather statement in place looking at about 5 to 10 centimeters tonight those winds still gusting upwards of 70 kilometers per hour so uh, visibilities will be less than two kilometers at times tonight uh, that rainfall warning still in place only looking at about another five millimeters through the night tonight as that system continues to track a little bit further east so Here's a look at the current satellite and radar. We are seeing that uh, heaviest rain has since pushed offshore uh, for the Avalon. So we did see some sun peak out a couple of hours ago, and that will continue as we head through the night tonight with those showers expected for the West Coast. Uh, you can see that classic calm ahead uh, out here, just how large that system is, and we'll continue to track a little bit further east uh, through the night tonight. So here's a look at that system, that heaviest rainfall for the Northern Peninsula overnight. We could see some flurries, and that will uh, head towards the morning hours as well with that chance of flurries and then into tomorrow things will clear out. We'll see some sun peak out at times with that chance of a few showers across the island and then staying uh, with that chance of flurries for Labrador. And then another system moves in Wednesday night, bringing that risk of rain right across the island uh, with morning snow possible again for the Northern Peninsula. And then it's Thursday when that system changes over. We'll see that temperature drop and then that potential for snow and that'll head towards uh, the interior uh, through the night on or rather through the day on Friday. So overnight tonight, things will stay clear for St. John, six degrees, still windy though, gusting upwards of 80 kilometers per hour, another five to 10 millimeters for Corner Brook. Those winds will stay strong again, gusting 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. And then Cartwright uh, holding on to that chance of flurries or light snow, rather five to 10 centimeters tonight, and then two to four centimeters on the way for Labrador City and minus four as your overnight low. So that's a look at tonight's forecast. We'll have all the details on tomorrow coming up. Back to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Ashley. Liberal MHA Jerry Byrne is the target of social media outrage today for a stand he took today and one he took more than a decade ago. Here and now's Colleen Connors joins us live with that story. Colleen, what's going on here? Well, when Jordan Stringer saw pictures of his MHA Jerry Byrne at a pride event in Corner Brook, it completely set him over the edge because he remembers when he was a younger gay man that Jerry Byrne had a very different position on gay rights. Take a look at this picture of Jerry Byrne at the flag raising ceremony in Corner Brook yesterday. Now Stringer remembers when Byrne was on the other side of gay rights and that's why he ripped into the MHA on Twitter and Facebook reminding people of Byrne's history. Now he claims that Byrne is hypocritical and homophobic. And Stringer, well, he wants an apology in person. All of a sudden, uh, I felt a punch in my stomach when I saw Jerry Byrne holding the pride flag. You cannot, in one hand, 
stand in the House of Commons and say that I do not deserve the equal rights of everybody else. And then when it becomes politically in season to take part in a pride flag raising ceremony, choose to put the other hand on my flag. That, Mr. Byrne, is wrong. So what is this all about? What is Stringer talking about here? Well, let me remind you, in 20, in, pardon me, in 2005, when Jerry Byrne was a Liberal MP, he stayed away from the controversial vote on supporting same-sex marriage. Then, a year later, the Conservatives under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, well, they wanted to reopen the debate that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Well, Byrne showed up to that vote. He voted in favour of the Conservative motion and against his own Liberal Party. So Stringer says he certainly hopes that Byrne has changed here. So on this issue, where does Jer Jerry Byrne stand today? Well, here is what he told me. Oh, I, I have fully support, uh, not only equal rights, but uh, the community being, uh, the gay community being, having the right of civil marriage. That is a very, very important right, and that is an evolution. I think it's, I think, feel very strongly that that's an evolution, not just in this constituency, but right across the entire country. And would you say that your opinions have evolved and changed since the, the constituents, what they thought in 2005, and is that why you're saying you agree with it today? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair point. There's, um, there's two roles of a legislator. One is to represent uh, their constituency's point of view. I think it is fair to say that there was many mixed feelings, there was a lack of information or a lack of understanding that may have occurred at that point in time. Well, Jerry Byrne says he will not apologize for his position in the past, nor he's not going to apologize to Stringer. But he says he will sit down with him and talk it out. Live in Cornerbrook tonight, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. Unifor has been ordered to pay up for its blockade of DJ Composites last month. A court settlement will see them pay about $160,000. More than half will go to local charities in the Gander area. Both sides were in court today. Lawyers for Unifor admitted the blockade violated a 2017 court injunction and apologized to a judge. Unifor blocked access to the DJ Composites plant in Gander for 10 days. Blockade ended when the company agreed to more bargaining and arbitration. That bargaining starts today. We've always negotiated in good faith, so this isn't a problem for us. Uh, we're professionals. We negotiate hundreds and hundreds of collective agreements a year, and uh, we'll put our best foot forward here and make sure that our members uh, get justice at the bargaining table. Well, the sun has just set outside the studios here in St. John's. It does look like we're in for a nice night. Those winds will still be quite strong. I'll have all the details on the forecast for tomorrow coming up.
Welcome back once again. Business owners and tech gurus are chatting in Cornerbrook this week at the Diversity Summit. This provincial gathering focuses on diversity in the technological world and the economy within small businesses. Guest speakers and a large crowd of participants spend three days learning how to advance the workforce to include people with different views and backgrounds. Diversity by its nature is disruptive. It brings people together with different backgrounds, different ideas, different perspectives on things, and that's great for problem solving and innovation. So tech is right on the cutting edge of that, and we thought that by focusing on that industry for the summit, we could uh, help you know, detail some of the lessons that businesses in particular, but organizations of all kinds can learn from tech's experience with diversity. Well, the legal countdown, sorry, the countdown to legal marijuana is just down to hours, and the country's first legal sale will happen in this province. But the CEO of Canada's largest cannabis company may not make it to the party. Here and now, Zach Gowdy joins us live with that side of the story. Zach, where are you to now? Well, I'm just outside the Tweed store on Water Street. Tweed is owned by Canopy Growth Corp, which is this province's exclusive marijuana supplier and one of the largest cannabis companies in the world. The chance to sell Canada's first legal marijuana represents a huge branding opportunity, and the company's CEO, Bruce Linton, was planning to be here himself to be behind the counter and make that first historic sale. But the weather here in St. John's today has been too warm windy for most planes to land at the St. John's Airport. Wind is picking up again, in fact, right now, while Linton has been stuck in Ottawa all day, along with most of the Canopy executives. I just spoke with their PR person a moment ago. She said they are intending to depart Ottawa in just a few minutes, arrive in St. John's at around 1030 and make it to the store in the very nick of time. Now, whether Linton makes it or not, Tweed is going big on tonight's event. They're planning to open the doors at 1130. They have Tweed branded merchandise to give out to the public. All the marijuana, it's already inside on the shelves. We caught a Brinks truck making that delivery just yesterday. And we will be here too. CBCNL will bring you that first historic marijuana sale. We're going live on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash CBCNL. I'll be hosting our Countdown to Cannabis special. We're going to start streaming around 11.45 Newfoundland time. The history-making moment happens at midnight. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Labrador City has, for now anyway, the only legal weed shop in the big land. Now, while the owner is busy getting ready to open, residents have no shortage of opinions when it comes to what legalization will mean for their small community. Here now is Jacob Barker has this snapshot from the Labrador Mall. So cannabis is legalized as of midnight tonight here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Woo! <laughs> You're happy about that? Yeah, it's medication. It's just good medication for yeah. my, my arthritis and anxiety and stuff like that. It calms okay. me down. Do you think they're doing a good job of uh, the way the government's been treating it and rolling this out? Well, no. not really, no. no. I don't. No. But it is what it is and a lot of people do it. What do you, what do you say about it? Right? Actually, I have no interest in it really, so it doesn't really bother me, you know, as long as it doesn't affect, affect me, I'm fine. It's more regulated. I guess that's uh, one good side of it. But again, it just seems to me that the society is, you know, just trying to, I guess, numb their pain with marijuana and alcohol. And it's just, it's just, another, it's just another sad step for society in Canada, as far as I'm concerned. Does everybody's personal use, whatever they want to do with it, do with it, right? Would you go down and buy some for yourself? Not for me, no. I don't do it, but well, I used to, but I think that it'll just be heavier narcotics coming into the community. How do you feel about the fact that there is one retailer here in town? Boy, well, I mean, it's better than there's one here than people buy it on the illegal market, so mm -hmm. in some way it can be reassuring, like it can make us feel better because at least the taxes and all the profits going to go to at least back to the government, not in the black market. For some, the mix of regulations across the country and a lack of up and running retail outlets means public availability may still be months away. CBC's Power and Politics host Vasi Capellos explains. We have worked over the past three years with provincial governments across this country to move forward on a regime 
that controls and regulates the sale of marijuana. Pot may be legal come October 17th, but where you live in Canada determines exactly what that means for you. Across the country, the minimum age for buying and consuming marijuana is either 18 or 19, depending on where you live. That could change, though, in Quebec. Its new CAQ government wants to raise the minimum age from 18 to 21. Only two governments are completely hands-off sales, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Private stores will sell marijuana there. In five jurisdictions, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI and Yukon, the provincial government will control all sales. The rest are a mix, usually with private store sales and government-run online sales. A heads up for people living in B.C. and Ontario, only one store will be open in Kamloops, B.C. on Legalization Day. And in Ontario, users can only order product online until stores open in April. Most provinces say you can light up where cigarette smoking is permitted and certain public spaces are prohibited, like parks and playgrounds where children might be. Four jurisdictions have chosen to crack down, though, on public use, restricting it to private property and private residences. But if it's not your residence, you may have zero options. Landlords could forbid marijuana use if you're a tenant. Live in a condo? Condo boards can also pass policies against lighting up. The federal government set a limit of four plants per household. Most provinces and territories followed that advice, but two provinces, Quebec and Manitoba, defied the order and are banning homegrown marijuana. And stay with CBC NL tonight. We'll cover cannabis legalization as the clock strikes midnight. We'll be live on Facebook to capture the historic moment. I think we're always about creating an intimacy on stage. A new album, a big tour. Next, we're talking to some of the once about the trio's latest work. Welcome back, everyone. Their three-part harmonies are unmistakable. It's the signature sound of the once from St. John's, but these days, they're not home much. Do you remember my face? If you can no longer see... The once latest album is titled Time Enough, 
The trio is in the middle of a province-wide tour, and then they're off to the mainland and on to Europe. So with that busy schedule, we were pleased Geraldine Hollett and Andrew Dale stopped by earlier today. Well, welcome, Geraldine and Andrew. So nice to have you here. And after looking at your schedule, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys doing? Doing one, great. One yeah. step at a time. That's right. One, day one, one day at a time, sweet <laughs> Debbie. Yep. Well, let's talk about your album, the new one, Time Enough. Um, I understand you composed a part and then you came back together to do the finishing touches. Something different for you, I understand. Uh, tell us about this album. Um, well, this album is... <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I've been having a lot of thoughts about this lately. The album is very um, of who we are now. But you remember my face If you can no longer see the Once latest album is titled Time Enough. The trio is in the middle of a province-wide tour, and then they're off to the mainland and on to Europe. So with that busy schedule, we were pleased Geraldine Hollett and Andrew Dale stopped by earlier today. Well, welcome, Geraldine and Andrew. So nice to have you here. And after looking at your schedule, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys doing? Doing great. One, one yeah. step at a time. That's right. One, day one day at a time, sweet <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> yep. Well, let's talk about your album, the new one, Time Enough. Um, I understand you composed a part and then you came back together to do the finishing touches. Something different for you, I understand. Uh, tell us about this album. Um, well, this album is... <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I've been having a lot of thoughts about this lately. The album is very um, of who we are now, and mm. based on the experiences that we've had in the last 10 years, even as a band or as individuals outside of the band, uh, there's a lot of chat about mortality, mm -hmm. um, your inner voice, uh, your inner child. Um, we delved a little bit deeper than normal because, like, we just we found a good safe place in each other, mm -hmm. and so. So, will fans hear a mature, a more mature sound, Andrew? I think we've grown so much over the years, and and learn so, so much natural. about about ourselves mm -hmm. and and each other and what makes each of us tick you know our strengths our weaknesses and we've just learned how to just to really have each other's backs you know and, and be incredibly supportive of each other I think we got incredibly honest I know I know certainly for myself and I'm and you I'm, can speak I, for I think us. I can speak for the three of us. Yeah. Is there anything really that honest. you're particularly proud of in the way this album uh, became the finished product. The fact that we didn't really say no to anything. No. I'm I, I proud mean, of yes. That. I mean, no. <laughs> no, that's, um. the, <laughs> but that's what I'm proud of most. Is like yeah. when we were in there, uh, we just took a look at our surroundings up at Den Livewell Studio in Lake Echo. Mm -hmm. We just that's took a in look. Nova Scotia. Yeah, yeah. and we yeah. took a look at the surroundings. And every studio we go into, that's what it's like. Mm -hmm. It's like, what can we use here? Like, Andrew plays most of the drums. All of the drums yeah. on the record, yeah. right? I didn't even know you played drums until this. I wasn't quite sure myself until <laughs> we started. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> but, you know, and then, you know, just, just to feel intimate with the space and then just give in to our surroundings. It felt really liberating. Yeah. Phil made this comment the other day. That would be uh, Phil Churchill, Phil the Churchill. missing person here today. That's right, uh, who was doing some some uh, some last minute groundwork out in Col uh, Cornerbrook. Um, in You're going to say Coley's Point. I was going to say Coley's Point. That's where you're from. See? <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. But uh, no, um, yeah, he made the comment the other day, it just th with this album, maybe even more so than any of the previous albums, when it was finished, like when we were finished in the studio and, and we walked out that door for the last time, you know, like when the album was, was officially Recorded. Our scheduled time was done. It was done. <laughs> yeah. And it, but it felt, it felt finished, you know, because because that's not always the case, you know. Yeah. Sometimes when you when you leave the studio, technically the album's done, 
but there's some lingering thoughts or, or some Doubt. doubts. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have any doubts. No. That we didn't really, we that didn't really feel that. That must be a good sign. It was an incredible feeling. Now, as I said in the introduction to this, uh, you're in the middle of the provincial tour, then you go to the mainland, mm -hmm. 20 stops along yeah. the way. Do you find that you, how many? Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that you fine tune each performance as you go? Yes. I think we're always about creating an intimacy on stage as well. So we're always we're always tweaking, you know, little bits here and there, even yeah, even right down to where we're standing in relation to each other. Mm -hmm. Because we're always wanting it to feel intimate. You know. I want to ask you about the European leg of this tour. You, that happens after Christmas. Pretty extensive, more than 20 stops there. Uh, you've been to Europe before. Does the audience react differently there than they do here or on the mainland? They stand up. Really? <laughs> <laughs> over in the UK and Europe, people stand up to shows. Like over here, people, I feel like when you sit down, your energy is just kind of in the chair. You're afraid to vocalize, you're afraid to sing, you know what I mean? Yes. But over there it feels like, they're like, okay, we're ready for this, let's do it now. We've learned all the words, come on. You know, cause, and they're standing and they're ready to just give. Yeah. And here you kind of have to coax them and that's fine too, I love that too. And I think we, we do it okay, I'm happy with how we do it. <laughs> we, we do okay. <laughs> come on out everyone, the show's pretty good. <laughs> Well, That's what I meant. It's, it's decent. <laughs> Speaking of energy, you two, I mean, how do you prepare? You're tied to each other yeah. during this long touring. How do, how do you manage to get some space? Way better now. Yeah. Oh my God, in the beginning we used to, we were, remember we used to be so afraid to talk to each other? We are so like passive aggressive with each other. We didn't have a clue, man. It was like, I think he's mad at me. Oh, I think she's mad at me. Like we didn't know how to bring it up. Or maybe I'm mad at her. Or maybe I'm mad at myself. We were so polite. Yeah. <laughs> and no, now we're just like, whatever. We've learned we've learned a lot space. over the years. He needs space. He's hungry. Yeah. <laughs> she's <laughs> definitely hungry. Usually we're just hungry. <laughs> if yeah. we get crabby, we're hungry. That's right. Yeah. But well, yeah, whatever just, you're doing, uh, it's working. It's working really, it's really good. well. Yeah. And I just want to wish you the best. Thank you. Aren't they so fun? They are very fun. <laughs> so they do resume their uh, provincial tour on Thursday. So they're playing a show, Grand Falls, Windsor, and then on the 19th in Gander, and then on the 20th here in St. John. So you might not be able to get tickets to come for away, but I'm <laughs> probably check out the once if you'd like.
We're looking, having a sneak peek at Ashley's map over there. It's entirely orange, at least for the island, which is all about the wind. Absolutely. So I guess the question, sorry to interrupt, is was there a part of the province that didn't have a wind warning today? Uh, not the island. We yeah. saw wind warnings all day today, and they are going to continue as we head through the night tonight. Uh, taking a look at that, uh, it does look like those wind warnings will be in effect for most of the night tonight. Look at these uh, current winds, 94 in the Rec House area, uh, 76 here in St. John's, and then Gander still seeing winds upwards of 87 kilometers per hour through the overnight tonight. Now, these strong winds will continue for the most part. Uh, parts of the northern peninsula could see... Uh, uh, gusts upwards of 130 kilometers per hour towards the coast and then through the night tonight Port of Basque again upwards of 100 kilometers per hour. Now heading towards the morning hours we will start to see these winds die down below warning criteria but still strong nonetheless into the afternoon tomorrow with gusts between 50 and 60 kilometers per hour for the most part and into Thursday those winds uh, will eventually die down finally across the island. So uh, heading into the next couple of days, as far as rain or snow goes, we're looking at uh, by tomorrow morning, that risk of showers and or snow or flurries in the morning hours for parts of the West Coast that will continue through the uh, afternoon tomorrow with some clear breaks across the island. And then again, looking at that flurry activity for most of Labrador through the day tomorrow. Uh, potential, we could see a few afternoon showers Hours scattered across the island, but then the next weather maker moves in Wednesday night into Thursday with more showers expected uh, for most of the province heading towards the Avalon by the time the evening and Thursday morning rolls around. And then that's when we're going to see those temperatures drop into the overnight with this next system moving in which means we could see some snow into the overnight hours. Towards the day, though, into Friday, uh, temperatures are going to jump back up above uh, the zero degree mark. So anticipating that it'll be either a wet snow or rain altogether, even though those models are spitting out snow at this point. So as far as what we're expecting tomorrow, those temperatures are going to drop quite a bit from today, about 10 degrees for St. John's, but that's still around seasonal for this time of year. Those winds out of the west gusting upwards of 50 kilometers per hour. Otherwise, temperatures in the high single digits uh, Corner Brook sitting at six degrees with that rain continuing through the day. Southwest winds upwards of 40 kilometers per hour and then up towards Labrador. Again, two uh, centimeters on the way for Labrador City. Happy Valley Goose Bay looking at flurries and plus one. Nain hovering around the zero degree mark and then Cartwright at two degrees tomorrow. Now into Thursday, uh, that's when we could see those temperatures drop in the morning, looking at uh, periods of rain for central Newfoundland, five degrees, six for western Newfoundland, and then uh, northwest winds for uh, western Labrador, looking at uh, gusts upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour and minus two St. John's, those windy conditions as well, and periods of rain into Friday. Uh, chance of showers slightly uh, towards the evening hours for St. John's at five. Four degrees for central Newfoundland. That's when we could see that chance of flurries and then showers late day for western Newfoundland. Debbie? Thanks, Ashley. In national news, one of Canada's most notorious killers has a parole hearing tomorrow. Paul Bernardo is expected to ask for a release. The convicted rapist and killer is now 54 years old and has spent 25 years behind bars. He's designated as a dangerous offender, but he can still apply for parole. Bernardo was kicked, convicted in the 1995 for killing two girls named Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. He was also convicted of manslaughter in the death of his then sister-in-law, Tammy Homolka. His ex-wife, Carla Homolka, who was also convicted for her role in the crimes, is free after serving 12 years in prison. A small plane crashed in rural West Ottawa earlier today, narrowly missing a house. Felt a major shake in the house and a bang because the ground wire had smashed into the home and it was, it was scary. I thought a car had gone into our house. The first responders found the wreckage just meters from a farmhouse. The male pilot, who was the sole occupant, was seriously hurt. He was rushed to the city hospital by helicopter. It's not clear what caused the plane to crash. What a beautiful shot here. I don't know if you guys were out this weekend, but the surf was insane uh, along the coast there. Any idea where that is? Can you give us a guess? Like, give us a hint? A hint, please. Island Labrador? A uh, bay. That narrows it down, Ashley. <laughs> 
That narrows it down. It's baby. I'll, I'll get better at this. <laughs> no, I'll, no uh, problem. Yeah, I'll tell you where that is uh, coming up in a little bit. <laughs>Welcome back once more. Let's see that lovely shot again. Mm -hmm. A beautiful photo today, uh, or rather this was this weekend. Mm -hmm. I just love the ocean. I'm so excited that I get to live on the ocean. <laughs> so, so are we. We're yeah. always very excited yeah. by the ocean. So any guesses? Oh. Uh, Northern Bay. Okay. Uh, down the south coast. Nope. No? Okay. Uh, on the Avalon. Oh. Bay Roberts. Oh, really? Yeah. Gorgeous mm. shot there. Uh, so is. this is, um, if we can get to it, there we go, Mad Rock in Bay Roberts. Okay. Yeah. So. I have definitely heard of Mad Rock. And I'm definitely going to have to make it out there one day. Yeah. You have lots trip. of islands. <laughs> I do. Uh, thank you, Karina Reed, for sending that photo. And if you have any photos you'd like to send to us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Well then. Uh, so I don't know if you've heard, but we've been talking about it all night. The <laughs> marijuana will go on sale at midnight. Zach Dowdy's doing a Facebook Live. That's yes. uh, the CBC NL Facebook page if you want to check that out. If you're up at 11.45, that's when it starts. But he'll be there when the first uh, well, bit of marijuana. History, yeah, they'll history. have the first legal sale in the country, so it is a big deal to many people. So if you want to stay up late, you can watch that. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching us. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Good night.